Good afternoon, my name is Kyle Lynch. It is Thursday, the 21st of October, 2021. I'm here with my colleagues at the Graduate Institute Geneva, fellow master's candidates Sam Molitor, Maria Vittoria Berardi, Michael Atkinson, and Yelena Minasian. Today we have a pleasure of sitting down with a leader in innovative approaches to wildlife conservation and protected area management. His organization is on the cutting edge of applying long-range, wide-area network technology to securitizing populations of endangered species around the world. Without any further ado, the co-founder and director of Smart Parks, Tim Fantam. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm Tim. I'm, I, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, um, and that's where Smart Parks is. Um, and personally, the way I got involved in conservation is that I went to uh, Africa for the first time with my parents and my brother and my sister to go on a safari when, uh, and that was already like 20 years back. And as a kid, I was really impressed by this, overwhelmed by nature. Like many people, I fell in love a bit with Africa, but only years later, I realized that uh, I needed to do something to, uh, to protect it. At a certain time, I was working at the telecom provider, working with technology. I got the understanding of how bad the ecosystems worldwide are, are, uh, are evolving. So I said, okay, what can I do? And I found out that rhinos uh, are being protected in a very specific way. If you have a, have a rhino in the wild uh, in Africa, uh, people are trying to poach it for the horns, especially, uh, which is market value of, uh, of more than half a million. So essentially, if you let such rhino walk around without any form of protection, then the chances of, of having it poached within no time is, is really high. So um, they're essentially walking body, bodyguards, uh, aka uh, rangers around, armed rangers around these animals all the time. And they were using like very old VHF radio trackers, which they implanted in the horns, which is kind of clever. But as a, as a person coming from a telecom provider working with high tech, I was like, eh, you are luring people into the area where this rhino is, because essentially with $10 equipment, you can track down a signal. So I said, ah, this has to be done re really in, in a better way. And I, um, I was working at telecom operator introducing a technology called LoRaWAN, which is like the Internet of Things technology, which is essentially a technology to connect everything we know to the internet. So I was like, oh, can't we use this to track Rhino in a safe way? Technology has evolved and things are safe. Data is protected, uh, signals are, are secured, etc. So why can't we use this for tracking Rhino? I found out that this is possible. And essentially I stopped, stopped my job at the telecom operator and started yeah, to explore this idea which in the end turned into the organization called Smart Parks. Could you maybe set out succinctly, uh, quickly, what the Smart Park is, what it entails? So Smart Parks, there are two things I would say. So Smart Parks is, in this case, the name of our organization. And our organization is, as what, what we call it, is a vehicle to do what we want to do. Uh, and that is protecting wildlife with passion and technology. And a Smart Parks is also a bit more. People have heard of the term smart city or smart harbor or smart industry. So essentially when people talk about the concepts that involve internet of things like 4G, 5G connected things all around the world, people try to see that as a next version of the industrial revolution where we digitize everything. We're talking about things as internet of things, big data, artificial intelligence. Knowing this from a telecom operator, we try to use the same tools and methods to apply to conservation and to protected parks. In a way, then you are talking about not smart cities or smart harbors, you are talking about smart parks. And that can range from park management all the way to wildlife protection, to law enforcement, to community conservation, all those activities people know. I'm just gonna to touch also on something you were saying earlier, if you're gonna have sensors on these uh, threatened species, how do you go about securing that data and that information that it doesn't go fall into the wrong hands. Yeah, I think as, as with every piece of information, you have the same problem. Digital information can transfer way faster. Uh, you can send all the information or so the tracks of a rhino of five years through one email to the, to the other side of the world or to a thousand people. The, the same digital tools can, can use a lot of encryption 
and keying and all kinds of digital mechanisms to secure something so that only you can see it or the people that are allowed to see it. So I've seen in one of your presentations that you and your team are planning to use technologies to prevent the human-animal conflict between elephants and farmers in protected areas in India. How do animal tracking technologies concretely help prevent the human-animal conflict indeed? I mean, you track the animal's position and then what? Uh, thank you for your question, Maria. It's part of the puzzle. You can, uh, so in the, in the direct case, you know when it's coming. So you see it coming, so you can prepare and alert and counteract. So when an elephant is coming out of the forest and going towards the village, uh, you can already anticipate and send people, rangers, to steer it in a different direction, trying to get the real-time information about the location. In the long term, you can also look at a lot of historic data, and then you can say, ah, This is like a very high risk area. And maybe we can build some interventions like corridors or fences. And then it's more like, yeah, based on long-term research, you can, you can plan for different approaches. We've made a system where there, there is an alarm triggered at the village when an animal is approaching, a siren and a, and a, and a signal light will be triggered. Instead, what is the difference in the technologies that you are planning to use in India with respect to the ones you used in Africa indeed? I mean, what are the specific technologies you are using? Uh, in this case, we try to use technologies that are open source, so easy to access in terms of e easy to get and also to, to easy to have access to in terms of knowledge. So we're trying to use technologies that are uh, not proprietary. We are not trying to use uh, technologies that are proprietary, meaning closed source, or only you can get it if you are part of a specific group or a company, or you need to pay a lot of money for it to even get a license. In this case, LoRa One is a, is a network standard that is very open in terms of people can, can share this technology worldwide. What are the potential challenges and opportunities you think you're going to face in Asia as regards the animal tracking technologies? I think it's more a cultural issue of us personally uh, trying to work in different places all over the work, world. We are really small. Uh, and yeah, India is different. It's a large area as well as in Africa. So every time you have to adapt and change the way you work, So uh, in India, for example, we are still looking like how can we work on a, a bit bigger scale without having to go there every year. So it's more an operational issue than, um, than a technology issue. All right. Thank you very much for that, Tim. I think something that I found interesting from the conversation thus far um, is the idea that technology and information is neutral, um, but the governance of that is really where we end up having dilemmas arise, where they could be used for, for let's say, negative means, but also used for positive means. Um, so from that, I was wondering, over the next 10 or so years, are there any big innovations in digital technology um, that you think could have a really big impact on conservation? Impact of technology being used for conservation is completely different than the impact of technology on the human planet. The whole earth and all ecosystems are being scanned like 24-7. Also uh, connecting like animals and ecosystems and measuring sensors, also the biomasses. Um, that is going to increase because also of satellite connectivity, but also because of ground connectivity and the, uh, yeah, the abundance of sensors. Yeah, the, the focus on, on, let's say, young people also making more out of, of these tools will also hopefully mean that, for example, in protected areas that are a bit more remote, that people get more used to using this data and then trying to get more understanding of their own environment closer to home. So it's not about us sitting here in the Netherlands watching over protected areas in Africa, but hopefully in the end it will be uh, young people uh, learning how to, to, to get all this data from the internet and trying to connect to it and to, to relate it to their own environment and then start to go into an action cycle. In a lot of places, as we know, remote areas, people still don't have internet. But we're with, for example, the, the coming of Starlink, the satellite internet satellite network of Elon Musk, which is really going to happen in the next two years. The world is going to change. Uh, it, it, so more people will get online. And then 
Yeah, I think in the far more future, after 10 years, it's more technical, but I think we will see more sensors being merging with, so yeah, electrical sensor merging with biosensors. Hello, Tim. Um, this, um, the, the mission that your organization bears is absolutely fascinating, but we would like to hear also how you would see the uh, the being incorporated your mission into the global or regional agendas for broader application. Is there any cooperation with regional or international actors? Yeah, so we are ourselves an international organization in a way that we are working cross borders every day. Um, so we are sharing knowledge. We are talking to people all over the globe. Uh, we are making the the code that we use to produce the, the sensors and the sensor itself. So all the hardware, the software, the firmware, it's all be, being made open source. So everybody on earth having access to this technology and tools can, can use it. So in, in that sense, it's already international. Um, and usually when we deploy a, a technology at a protected area, we try to demonstrate it at the same time. So it's more also giving an experience and explaining everything in detail to the people. People see the opportunities and try to yeah, understand like, oh, these are all the things we can do. Some people take it further and some people or organizations just stop there and maybe another couple of years to, to think about it or to try it. So the sooner we introduce this um, to, to new areas where, where, where there is conservation efforts, the earlier people have access to this and to learn it and to try it. And then when, let's say, the mainstream of all other industries around conservation also start to use it, they are already on the level of, hey, we know this and we, 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 we know where this is going and we can already anticipate. Try to bring conservation a bit ahead of the curve in terms of technology and not always lagging behind. So you mentioned the integration of contemporary digital technologies into smart cities and smart harbors and sort of the global transition um, that we're experiencing now. I'm curious how your organization is going to move away from just the long range wide area network technology um, and specifically foray into becoming sort of a holistic park service, as you mentioned, getting involved with the transportation and the tourism and the building and the securitization uh, of a park as well. Well, essentially, it's the other way around. It, it it did start with the rhinos, so tracking the rhinos. But before we even did that, we first had to install a network and had to prove that the network was working. So we started with a network. We started with a holistic approach. The first thing we did was tracking vehicles uh, and gates. So all the access gates to the park and around the park, uh, the fences. So is, is there electricity still on the fences? Uh, the water tanks, the fuel tanks, the roads. Uh, the boats, the rangers. So we started the other way around, essentially. What we do see is that you got we, you see more things like acoustic sensors, which is more an environmental sensor, uh, which is very interesting, especially with artificial intelligence. So we try to, uh, in a way, add sensors to the trackers that are on the animals so that they become sentinels. And in this case, for example, you can analyze the communication patterns of elephants in real time meaning you can listen to very low rumbles, which you cannot hear with the human ear, but you can essentially hear it with, uh, uh, with, with, with a sound device or with a microphone. And then we can understand what they are trying to say, analyze it real time on the collar, and then communicate back to us, like, ah, this animal is in distress, or even this animal has detected the poacher. We wanted to use this opportunity to thank Tim again for joining us this afternoon and to let our listeners know you can follow Tim Van Dam and his organization at smartparks.org. Uh, we did have the chance to ask Tim a few more questions uh, and just get some closing thoughts uh, from him. So um, thanks for tuning in and uh, here's what he had to say. The first principle is don't put a tracker on an animal. Just leave the damn animal alone. All the animals you're trying to call are you need to, you need to sedate them anyway, so you don't want to do it. Uh, and number two is that for each animal, you have very well, uh, well educated experts who say, oh, this is what, what we can do. We can make a tool, we can make a sensor, we can make it this small and then tell them what we can produce in terms of data. And, they, and then they say, yeah, this is what we need. Or they say, no, this, this, we can't do this. A lot of people in the field doing conservation, they, they really look for 
clever people that can guide them a bit in this world of technology. So I think it's a very, very important course you're doing and uh, hopefully uh, we also inspire people.